Hello, welcome to Barn Blog, and today I'm here with Jonathan Cadman of Real Progressives, and we are talking about a bunch of stuff. Um, your interest in MMT, your increasing interest in socialism, um, commodities, state uh, state by state best insurance uh, insurance initiatives, the work of Claire of uh, Claire Matai. We're going to be talking about a lot of stuff today, so. Um, Jonathan, um, you've been with Will, uh, Real Progressives for how long? Uh, about a year and a half. Okay. Um, that actually makes you a little bit late to the, to the modern monetary theory game. Um, when did you get interested in MMT? Uh, probably a year prior, um, was when I stumbled onto it and it was in the process of uh, kind of a, uh, a decision that I made at a certain point that I, I really need to reteach myself economics because what I did or what I thought I knew, uh, which was very simple and rudimentary was not adding up. So in the course of that journey, I, uh, I sort of accidentally stumbled upon uh, first some MMT adjacent people that, uh, you know, started making a whole lot more sense to me than a lot of the, the traditional uh, new Keynesian or, or post Keynesian uh, regular uh, people. And I think uh, it started with um, wanting to say it was Mariana Mazzucato, uh, whose work I liked. And I found she had um, done a book uh, called Rethinking Capitalism where people like Randy Ray and Stephanie Kelton and a few other people had chapters and reading through that was how I got turned on to their work. But uh, I'm one of those weird people that uh, I don't need to learn things in sequence. Like I don't mind if you spoil the end of a movie or something like that. I actually kind of like the, the notion of working backwards. So I sort of backfill, um, you know, as I'm learning, uh, and, and developing and, and growing and kind of growing my body of uh, understanding that way. Okay. And how did you get interested in socialism? Because while MMT is sometimes associated with it, it doesn't have to be. So uh, I had a, a predisposition to, um, to being broadly, uh, I guess, uh, leftist, uh, you might say. Uh, before I actually started getting any real exposure to uh, to any of the the literature and, and theory around uh, around socialism, I just I had a predisposition towards it. But largely, I had come to those conclusions on my own. I'm like, oh look, somebody came to the same conclusion a century, a century and a half ago. Uh, but I'll admit, just as a kid that grew up Jewish, uh, you know, even spent some years in religious school. And was, uh, you know, have had, you know, ongoing encounters with um, the religious Jewish community. It, uh, even though I was never one of them myself, it kind of reminded, like, there was a certain degree to which uh, I was a little bit prejudiced against Marxists because certain aspects of Marxist orgs and the way they talk to and amongst one another reminded me unpleasantly of a bunch of rabbis arguing about the Torah. And so it took me a good long while to actually kind of get past that and and start plugging in some of these um, notions like um, like mate like dialectical materialism and things like that, even after I had come to the conclusion that all of these things were interrelated, because I had also done kind of deep dives and teaching myself psychology, uh, history, um, you know, all kinds of other things besides just economics and realizing that these things are are all interconnected and you know they have a, a you know a strong matrix of um you know of of class and a, a class overlay and a strong degree of like their patterns of intentionality and in everything um you know even though not everything is obviously somebody pulling a string like you can see these patterns of of powerful people um, kind of, of influencing these things in just such a way, in just such a time. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, it's hard to avoid. And so it, it, it leads you down a path. Uh, and the more I backfill, uh, the, the clearer things become. 
But I will say there are certain certain aspects um, of Marxism and you know a lot of the Marxist orgs that I still find a bit intimidating. And I, I rely, I and I have relied heavily on people like you uh, who have gone deep down that rabbit hole to uh, kind of uh, of interpret and give me the 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 Reader's Digest version rather than wading super deep into it myself. You don't want to read 700,000 pages of Marx and then, you know, uh, several libraries full of interpretation and secondary literature? I have started reading Capital, uh, mm -hmm. but I got Gundrisa and I was told don't, don't bother. Uh, read the Reader's Digest versions of it. Uh, yeah, I mean, Gundrisa is interesting because Gundrisa has more in it that's uh, more compatible with neo chartalism um, because it doesn't assume only commodity and credit money. Um, it does talk a little bit about state money and fiat money, which Marx like plays around with like like this. For those of you who are listening and watching, this just me waving my hands. Um, I think there's reasons for it, and it's. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to get into my critique of contemporary MMT too much today because it's not actually a MMT is wrong. Uh, it's a MMT has naturalized certain conditions that we currently exist in, but and have existed in in the past, such as in colonial America, um, ancient Mesopotamia, uh, but. Uh, the the work of uh, a uh, a friend of mine named Colin Drum goes into uh, periods where it doesn't apply, um, and that's going to be interesting uh, for the near future. Uh, my you know my my main critique of MMT has not been actually about its economics. It's been about the fact that it has no real sociology attached to it. Um, and so you can be an MMT -er and have a pretty good understanding of, of uh, fiat currency and what it can do, how you can use it to target and generate production, how you can use it to generate credit. Um, but there's no way anyone's just going to give you a jobs guarantee, right? It's not really in their interest. And that was always my critique is that I thought some MMTers, not all, uh, Bill Mitchell can't be can't be accused of this, and, and um, some other MMT Marxist hybrid people can't be accused of this, but kind of had a naive view of like why the ideology of of austerity was so common, and you know it, basically that it was a mistaken ideology, and I'm like, no, they know what they're doing, yeah. <laughs> like, like, and know. that's the beauty of, of uh, what, what Clara Matei kind of brings to the table mm -hmm. is, uh, and, you know, I've seen uh, little little bits and pieces of that elsewhere as well. And, you know, her, even the original research she does kind of helps validate and connect some of that stuff that there is absolutely intentionality behind a lot of that stuff. And you have to, if you actually want to make any real changes you have to understand what you're up against and who's against you and what they're prepared to do to keep things the way they are. And that gets really ugly when you know the history, like really ugly, violent, dangerous, very scary. Well, it's one thing, you know, your recent article on um, Unreal Progressives called It Almost Happened Here about the banker's plot, more or less. Um, it's like the most obvious example of that. But when you read Claire, Claire Matei's work, um, and for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, her recent book, The Capital Order, which came out last year, it becomes pretty clear that, that this has been a long-standing sort of assault on, and a structural assault on um, popular sovereignty and, and anything like uh, welfare, what welfare games we've been we've been given have been clawed back, um, and often clawed back in ways that aren't obvious. I mean, there's the obvious austerity, but there's lots of small ways too. And then a lot of the solutions we're giving, and this actually gets to an article you wrote about a year ago, but I thought it was actually really smart, are solutions that we kind of know won't work. 
So, for example, state-based single-payer initiatives are a bad idea, right? Um, so, would you like to talk about, like, why in some ways those things may actually be helping the capital order <laughs> instead of hurting it? Yeah, I uh, in that article, I, I put out uh, kind of a list of, of various um, kind of angles at which it's a problem. And, you know, one of the the conclusions you kind of get when you put all those things together is that to a large degree, it's kind of a uh, like a, a flytrap for activist energy, because, um, you know, for example, um, you know, there is the fact that uh, it's much cheaper to uh, buy a state legislator uh, for a lot of these big insurance companies uh, than it is to um, to buy a federal legislator. And that these guys are really tightly buttoned down and they know what their job is. Uh, there is the fact that, of course, states are users of currency, uh, not issuers of currency, which means they have very, very hard budget limits. And it would be super easy for these gigantic mega corporations who are all, each and every one of them, and not just the insurance companies either, but the pharma companies, uh, the distributors, the dialysis companies, the hospital companies, they are all at the very tippy top of the Fortune 500 list. And many of them have, um, you know, greater assets, greater profit revenues than uh, the vast majority of the countries that are in the UN. And these are countries with millions of people, with armies, with air forces, with navies. Um, like that's the kind of resources you're talking about. Any one of these companies could easily uh, if the worst happened, bankrupt a state, like just by withdrawing their resources from that state. And uh, these, like these, they know the game, like these people know the game. And so do the politicians that are being lobbied. There is that kind of naivete you were talking about earlier in advocating for something like this, uh, in not realizing what you're up against and the forces arrayed against you. And the only way that you could think something like that would work and that you're not going to get a rapid and decisive counterattack is going to squash it before it's even born, uh, you're, you're deluding yourself. There is one force that you would have to hijack that is still powerful enough to stand against, uh, you know, forces that big. And you will have to go to war with those forces within the federal government before any of that stuff will ever be allowed to happen. And like even now, because these people adapt a lot faster than we do, okay? Even now, you see what they're doing with Medicare Advantage. They are hedging because they see that, you know, in the, in the public opinion polls, that momentum is going in that direction, that there's a great deal of support for something like Medicare for All. So they are making sure that they still have their fingers in the pie, even to Medicare, and they're privatizing it with Medicare Advantage. Uh, so they know what they're doing. And this notion that you can go state by state and they're just going to sit idly by and allow it to happen is is nonsense. And I think we saw that with the CalCare debacle. Um, you know, you you have somebody like Gavin Newsom promising when the stakes are non-existent. Oh, sure. I'd sign something like that into law. And when he thought there was a danger, something like that might actually pass. And they asked him about it. He started hemming and hawing. And then, you know, they basically made sure that thing was killed before it ever hit the floor. Um, yeah. So that was, you know, the short, short version of it. But I do lay out in the article, uh, you know, kind of a lot more specifics, uh, more drawn out arguments for why these things are the case that uh, I hope people that are kind of entertaining that it's harmless or it's, you know, we should keep doing it at the same time. We'll take a look at and realize why. Uh, it's not just, uh, it's not harmless. It's, it's actually quite actively counterproductive and distracts energy from where you need to be putting it. Well, one of the things you point out is a lot of the models for this are based off Canada, where they have to ignore some of the problems with provincial administration of education and health care. Um, and that's, that's with, you know, the federal, uh, the Canadian federal government making sure to some degree that these programs are backed monetarily and um, Canada is a big enough country that it has relative currency sovereignty, at least um, compared to some other states. 
in that are near to our orbit. Um, and so it's it still creates problems for Canada. You talk about the 1962 Drockter strike, for example. Um, and when you're thinking about the United States, where there could be, to some degree, healthcare flight and um, just budget problems, because you're you're right, uh, you know, not non-federal agencies are takers of currency. They cannot set currency policy. They do not have anything like uh, currency sovereignty, uh, nor would, nor nor could they either constitutionally, and I would argue with what maybe California could and Texas could, but even they wouldn't have trade parity to be able to pull it off with if if we did have fragmented currency. So you shouldn't want anything like that anyway. Um, it, it, it just seems. <laughs> You know, it just seems part and parcel because one of the things I have noticed about the clawing back of anything that came out of, say, the New Deal or the Great Society is that state block grants are great for screwing that up. Um, One, because it allows the state to administrate it locally, which also often turns people against these programs because the programs are administered so poorly. Um, But two... Um, it means that states who have to have to collect taxes have have to actually raise revenue or deal with bonds on the bond market and risk their state's uh, standard and poor's rating, et cetera. And a lot of these states have balanced budgets amendments um, so that, well, you know, it will turn people against it because it'll raise their taxes in ways that it, if the federal government does it, it's not necessary, right? Like, it's just the federal government can run a deficit. Uh, if there is any danger to running a deficit, it is two things uh, that come up in m and One is you outstrip production. Um, that can actually cause inflation. The idea that m and don't have any theory of inflation is wrong. Um, there's a couple of them, though. Um uh, Warren, Warren Mosler's is 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 uh, one of the more interesting, and then there's also I think Kelton has one that's kind of similar, but um, there's a lot of literature about um, you know you don't have to worry about inflation until your production goes down. And the United States, despite it, despite the fact it doesn't employ a lot of people in production, is still a second or third, depending on the year and the time, most productive economy in the world. So. I think that's really interesting to think about like subtle ways in which austerity and clawing back have happened through block grants, through federalization, through state administration, through farming this out, even constitutionally, um, and also making our system impenetrable to navigate um, from state to state because all these things have different state laws. I mean, there's basically 50 different sets of laws for the administration of federal programs. Most of the time, there's a few exceptions to that social security, but in general, that's the way it works. So yeah, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great point. You know, one of the things I was thinking when I read your recent article, and by the way, I'm going to link these in the show notes for those of you who are following along um, about the banker's plot is that the banker's plot was too obvious. <laughs> like, like, they got smart. <laughs> but uh, what did you learn studying the banker's plot? Because I, I, I actually found your article on it interesting. And so um, what did that make clear to you? It made clear to me that it was never... Like, these people understand how money works. It was never about the gold standard itself. It was never about the money itself. They were not worried about their assets. What they were worried about was their system. Uh, The system uh, in the face of a lot of popular uprising, you know, a demand for accountability amongst the public. You had a massive wave of of, uh, public education that uh, I've referenced in previous articles that book money, power, and the people. But you had even these these farmers, you know, going to to mobile libraries and and taking any book on 
uh, money, economics, monetary policy that they could get their grubby hands on and reading those things by lantern light. Have you ever tried to read a book by lantern light? It's, it's a very flickering, insubstantial, like it's headache city. Like these people were serious and they were demanding accountability and they were starting to become aware, more aware at least, of what was going on. And that was what these people were terrified of. And they were prepared to go to fairly extreme measures to uh, essentially uh, keep Pandora's box closed because they reckon that once these people realized that, uh, you know, gold standard based austerity was a giant lie, that their hands, you know, the government's hands were not tied. The government was perfectly capable of making their lives better, of making society more democratic, of um, making sure that, you know, labor uh, had a, a much more significant share of control over the future of the country. Um, that they were like, they were so alarmed that they were willing to risk, even, you know, though they had a great deal of control over the political system already, they were willing to risk potentially, you know, is, uh, something as extreme as, as charges of treason, which still carries the death penalty. And, uh, you know, to get this stuff done now, they failed pretty spectacularly, but you'll notice nobody was held accountable. Uh, nobody was charged with anything, even though the Congressional Committee uh, concluded that, yes, a conspiracy uh, did take place. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they they decided, like you said, to get smart and to keep it subtle that the direct approach was uh, at least off the table for now. Uh, but that was that was kind of the conclusion that I, I got from it, that these people were protecting a system not their pocketbooks. One thing that I ha have known for a while is uh, commodity money, like true commodity money, like actually trading in gold. Um, because commodity money, for people who don't know how we use this term in MNP circles and Marxist circles, is a literal commodity. It is not a commodity backed money. It is not. Um, a credit money or a fiat currency or state currency, as you call it, an MMT. Um, it's literally trading in some kind of stamped and controlled goal like England in the 13th century. Um, the United States has never really done that. I mean, there has been a gold trade internally, but it's never been like our official currency. Uh, and that includes pre-revolution Um uh, one of the things that I learned from Christine Donson, and I have been reading some critiques of her that I think we should should be taken seriously. Um, but how much the colonies actually ran off of script money, basically, um, and how they would control inflation and whatnot was literally just taxing to destroy currency. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's not even. You know, it's not even uh, commodity. Commodity money is not a huge part of the American system. Um, commodity backed money was always also kind of an interesting thing because the how much gold was backing a dollar was variable even during the Britain Wood system. Um, so it's it's always interesting to me, like when people are like, oh, we need to return to the gold standard. I'm like, but I don't think the gold standard works. The way you think it does, a, um, it's deflationary. Um, it makes debt, you know, go nutty. Um, it it hampers your ability to adjust to the business cycle, which means recessions and depressions are much worse. Um, but even in Marxist circles, I mean, uh, you know, Marx is, you're right about the Talmudic nature of Marxism. In fact, that one of the, the three big Talmudic debates of all Marxists is one, markets are no markets. Two, uh, until, until socialism, do we or do we not uh, try to link ourselves to the gold standard, um, which is a minority position, but it was position believed like by people like Trotsky, actually. And three... Um, 
what is value? Uh, which Marxists don't. I mean, yes, we all, mo all Marxists more or less believe in labor theory of value, but as to what we think that is, it's actually a huge debate. Um, MMT is interesting to me because it just brackets all that out. Like, like one thing that I think is interesting though, as a person who does believe that the Marxist value stuff actually kind of does matter. Um, it's interesting seeing MMTers read people like uh, Claire, Claire Matei, Matei because she actually does think that value is super important to understand the, the capital order. Um, but she's not one of these people who like rejects fiat currency or thinks it's some kind of, I don't know. Uh, my favorite crackpot Marxist theory is, is when they call everyone who, who proposes fiat currency fiat currency fascist that one's fun um uh, she's not one of those people so what have you made out of engaging with people from a you know like clarinete who come from a different tradition and you know than mmt uh that there's a certain degree to which um they they kind of they can plug into one another in the sense mm -hmm. that like you know even uh, skipping around capital, like when I was uh, looking at, uh, you know, kind of how he describes money, he describes there's a lot of descriptions of certain aspects of money and value and things like that. But there's not that kind of there's not a whole lot of deep diving into uh, the deeper nature of money itself. And, uh, you know, that if you combine those two things, um, they they can work well together. But um, to me, like you can't understand the world without, uh, you know, a lot of the, the insights that come from the Marxian tradition and the connections between sociology, psychology, history, uh, material relations um, and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, the uh, MMT economics is, in a sense, um, kind of at least to, to some degree, a victim of the mindset that Clara Matei describes and, you know, that various other people have described in economistic thinking, this uh, notion that it's in, in, you know, a completely isolated, abstract, uh, like a natural science sort of thing, like a pure science that you can just, uh, you know, determine these things in a vacuum. And, you know, you, you do have to understand how these things connect and how they interact. And I promise you, the people on the other side of the equation absolutely are doing that. And we pointed out, uh, I think, in our organization, one of our favorite videos to share uh, is um, Alan Greenspan explaining to uh, Paul Ryan that, uh, that no, Social Security is not, you know, doesn't need to, you know, is not going to go insolvent. There's nothing to stop the federal government from, if it goes empty, just filling it right back up again. Uh, the issue is real resources. But you'll notice they don't spend a lot of time talking about that out loud to the public. Uh, but they know it's a thing, and they use those insights into how money works when it comes to spending on things that uh, perpetuate the current order, that uh, benefit imperialism, uh, military industrial complex, corporate welfare, um, you know, uh, things of that nature. Uh, but when it comes to uh, things like, say, Medicare for all that average people me need, they're like, oh, sorry, our hands are tied. And so in, in some ways, they found they found additional roundabout ways to institute um, or to substitute for the gold standard kind of austerity, like our hands are tied. And, you know, those that consensus that uh, that is, you know, kind of uh, public common sense now that budgets have to balance uh, is what they've so carefully maintained, uh, even though the gold standard is gone and it's not it's not truly applicable anymore. So, yeah, I mean, even internationally, as long as the United States has a fairly strong productive economy, they they will be included in forex even if they're even if like say the petrodollar ends which is a real possibility um there is still enough of a role for the us dollar because of its productive capacity to be at least part of a forex basket which means it will have 
um, still international purchasing power, right? Then that's what that's what uh, is important. One of the things I think is interesting, as my friend Colin Drum has pointed out, when world systems break down, um, currencies tend to go two ways. They either tend to be really internalized and self-contained, like those colonial currencies, or they tend to go to some kind of hard commodity. But that's because the systems are breaking down and there's like no singular or there's no there's no state or even quasi state entity that can can actually enforce uh, a currency um but as you know as even marx realized uh, gold only has value because we think it does like <laughs> like uh, i mean it like you know it's not it does there's nothing inherent to it uh and in fact in so much that it has use it's a bad currency um, you know, if you eat your currency literally by using it, then you are hyper deflationary. And if anyone wants to know the problems with that, they can just look like Bitcoin because Bitcoin was designed by gold buggers and it was designed to act like gold, which means it's hyper deflationary. Um, might be useful as a Ponzi scheme investment, but it's not useful for anything else. Right. And the other thing is that, um, you know, one of the, the aspects that, uh, you know, MMT tries to emphasize, which, you know, certainly it shares with uh, other conceptions of money, is that fundamentally, uh, you know, one of its most important functions is as a unit of value. It's, it's uh, you know, kind of a measuring stick in a sense, an abstract measuring stick. So this gold, the value of gold has to be measured in something, uh, units of account. And that's an important function of, you know, these kinds of, uh, of state monies or uh, script or, or any of these kinds of, of things is uh, measuring how much this stuff is worth. Because if you can't trade it for something that has uh, some sort of quantifiable, uh, you know, uh, unit of account, then, you know, it's just a rock you're holding. Yeah. Shiny metal rock. Um, and and that's 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 an important thing to to realize. I mean, if you go into the deep history of money, like um, electrum, which is one of the earliest forms of money, is used because it's convertible, not because it has any inherent value, but like you can melt it down and and trade it, and then turn it into things you can wear or whatever. Um, but what's interesting about that is if you really look at it, its value is not set like from across the trade route it's actually specific to each polity so like each city they have a they have like a a trade exchange between each other and then it, and then internally there's something different uh internals and this is something i will say marx actually does get wrong because he just assumes the story and adam smith is correct um uh, most societies do not actually ever develop currency from barter not internal to themselves. Like if there's trust in the society, there's credit and debt. And that's how it works. It's basically you go from a gift economy to a credit and debt economy. Uh, Charles Knapp, I mean, not Charles Knapp, that's Charles Ennis, but Fred, uh, Friedrich Knapp is the first to to really come with this theory, although he accepted the barter theory. Ennis in, in England uh, is is the big person who points out that that's not true. And then later anthropological studies verify that, that like, no, we did not barter with one another. We had basically an internal gift economy and a debt credit economy. And that's how most of these things have functioned. Um, if there was a unit of something like commodity money, it was usually to trade between cities, not within them. Um, and that's yeah, Clint Ballinger goes into that. Um, that's uh, he's somebody that we've had on the podcast a couple of times, uh, the Macro and Cheese podcast. Uh, he's uh, kind of a he, he's a like an economic anthropologist. Mm -hmm. uh, does some archaeology stuff to ancient history of money, um, and and he goes into a lot of that that kind of stuff and um, uh, has has discovered some some fun stuff about you know even. Uh, some situations where they were using like bricks of of, uh, of salt to trade between one another, but it, it was like you said, things that were uh, set independently. These, yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, actually, you know, the popularization of this anthropological research is David Graeber's death from, like, I guess now 13 years ago. Um, and, and anthropologists have kind of known this for a while, both anarchist and Marxist ones. <laughs> so it's, it's taken a while to kind of dribble out into society. Um, so that, that's interesting to me. One of the things I've been really kind of fascinated with um, and quote heterodox economic theory, which is just everyone who's not a neoclassical, um, is kind of the split between Keynesians um, and post-Keynesians. Because when I first encountered MMT, it was lar it was not the kind of revival of the chartalist tradition that it is now. It was actually sort of chartalism as interpreted through Minsky. Um, this was this was like a decade and a half ago at this point. Um, and it was kind of concurrent to Warren Mosler's early books. Um, and what I find interesting about that is like, basically there's, I don't think Keynes is actually consistent on what money is, um, for reasons that I don't entirely understand, because at some points he seems to be very close to like an MMT understanding and at other points he's not. Um, but it's basically now with post Keynesians, you have two schools. Uh, well, you have multiple schools. You really have like the ones that have moved closer to chartalism. And then you have this other variety that has dropped even the basic Keynesian proviso, proviso of like spend run deficits when times are, are bad, uh, tax when times are good. Um, and instead they've embraced neoclassical monetarism. And we see this with uh, an austerity hawk like Larry Summers, or even someone who, you know, Mr. Print the Coin himself, uh, Paul Krugman, who's like really seemed to have ran precipitously in the other direction in the past five years. Um, what do you think is driving that? Do you think it's like, do you think that's a leak capture? Do you think it's uh, ideology? Do you think it's some kind of subtle mixture of both? I, I definitely say mixture of both uh, because, you know, if anybody, uh, if any group of people are kind of uh, agents of the existing order, it's um, it's well, particularly Larry Summers. Um, and, you know, this is uh, Larry Summers, of course, uh, being the uh, the nephew of Paul Samuelson, uh, you know, the guy who, who basically uh, sanitized canes for the, for the post cold war era. And, uh, you know, not that, that Keynes was any kind of socialist or communist. I did read that book we were talking about. Uh, he's definitely a defender of, uh, you know, the fundamentals of capitalism, but, uh, evidently they thought, uh, some of his suggestions, you know, were, were a little too dangerous and they sanitized it, but these are, are definitely, uh, you know, agents of the capital order, uh, you know, it, very few people, I would say, are more responsible for, um, you know, the collapse of, of uh, more economies uh, than Larry Summers, you know, in the 90s, shock therapy in Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, in the, you know, uh, there was the deregulation of, of uh, commodities futures trading, um, you know, that basically led to the 2008 crash. Um, you know, and of course him, you know, basically, uh, saying I've got 13 bankers in my office. If you don't bail out the banks right now, like that's Larry Summers is that guy. Uh, and Paul Krugman, of course, is, uh, I don't know if you ever got around to reading the Nobel factor, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, that's definitely an instrument of propping up economics that is beneficial to the capital order. So even, uh, you know, the people you might say are, uh, the most reasonable amongst Nobel Prize winners are still people whose work they found uh, beneficial to perpetuating the current order of things. So, yeah, I do think elite capture is probably uh, the biggest part of it. And also, to some degree, probably a, a little bit uh, in the case of Krugman of uh, good old fashioned brain rot. You know, certain things they were they were programmed into them that they're unwilling to let go of, no matter how much evidence they see to the contrary. Yeah, 
I was actually thinking about, hmm, there's literally one economist I'll defend who won a Nobel Prize, and that's Eleanor Ostrom, and that's it. Like, it's like you know, and she's the person who who um, illustrated that there was actually a solution to the tragedy of the commons other than privatizing everything. But even her work actually can be interpreted in a capitalist way, um, which I, I've talked about before on this channel. But in general, yeah, I don't like if someone wins a. If the Swedish central bank, even though Sweden is theoretically a social democratic country, um, see my episode on Sweden from a year ago with Mir Ball about why that's kind of misleading. Um, if the Swedish central bank gives you an award, you're probably not on the side of the angels. Right. Um, you know, just, you know, it, it, just uh, to put that out there. I mean, um, they're not all equally bad. I mean, like, I think Krugman and Krugman, Krugman, you're right to me. I just can't explain because he's been on both sides of these questions often. Um, like I said, I, re I remember him being one of the first people to scream mint to coin a decade ago. Um, so he seemed at least theoretically open to things like MMT. Um, but n now he's an active enemy. Uh, seems to be more and more in the Larry Summers camp. Larry Summers has always been a ghoul. Paul Volcker's always been a ghoul. Um, and one of the things that I have pointed out to a lot of progressives is that a lot of these like soft social democratic and Keynesian states actually neoliberalize further because it's easier for them to do because they can basically switch, flip a switch, um, which I don't think people realize. Um, Ironically, when I first figured this out, it was from reading Naomi Klein's The Shock Doctrine, a book that I don't love. But she kept on describing like, oh, all these Keynesian regimes neoliberalizing even further than like their right wing counterpart. The big example she gave was uh, the post um, Pinochet government versus the Pinochet government. Um, the post Pinochet government neoliberalized further, even though it was ostensibly left in quotation marks. Um and so, you know, that's always been my hesitation. And when I first encountered MMT years about a decade ago, um, and then especially after Stephanie Kelton, who, whose work I like-ish, um, they would tell me that this was an ideology problem. And I'd be like, I don't know, man. I look at the history, and this does not look like an ideology problem, as we've been saying. Like, it looks like they knew what they were doing. They were on deficits fine when it's not about welfare and, and whatnot. Um, this seems this seems like they absolutely know uh, that they're defending the order. And it's not just that they want the money. It's that they want the power the money brings. Like, they want to be able to command labor. One of the reasons why Marxists have always said, like, don't promise under capitalism a, a job guarantee is because the capitalists will never let it happen. That would destroy, absolutely destroy the power of the sack. Right. Right. You know, and, and all of a sudden, like they can't control their, the workers anymore. Like I admit, for example, that like a jobs guarantee would do more for workers than a minimum wage, which is why it won't happen unless you have a lot of power. Like, um, and, and I just, I just remember just looking at MMTers and going, how are you just naive? And then I was like, this is willful. Not that you're, not that you're like part of the capital order, but like it's a, I don't want to have to, to say that we're going to have to do something more radical than what I'm trying to sell. Right. Like, well, to, in some cases, yes. In a lot of cases, I can say as somebody who it was a process getting there, um, there is, you know, and the older you are, the worse it is, but there is, I think people underestimate, cause I've also done a deep dive into, you know, psychology, uh, mass communications and propaganda, things of that nature, understanding how these things work on human psychology. And I think people underestimate the degree of milieu control, uh, that these, uh, you know, that the people that were steering the ship have really had over particularly people in the United States, but really all over, uh, you know, the Western global north uh, in particular. 
Uh, and there's a lot of assumptions that we are trained subtly not to question or that, uh, you know, people don't question until they have a really good reason to. And you go along with these kind of mental shortcuts, these assumptions, uh, without ever really stopping to interrogate them. And sometimes it's become so core to what you're what you've been doing that uh, people experience a considerable degree of uh, psychological distress, uh, sometimes bordering on physical pain when they're too invested in in that assumption or they've made too many assumptions based on that assumption that they never bothered to question. And it's in, in the best of cases, cognitively difficult for people to uh, break out of those kind of invisible barriers that have been placed around them. And so I do think there's a lot of people that are sort of unconsciously, but you can see it in their body language almost, avoiding the, uh, the distress of stepping into the unknown and outside the comfort of what they thought they knew and really just upending their whole view of the way things work. And so I, I do think uh, that's the boundary. It's hard to get people across, even though they can see parts of it. They still want to uh, retreat towards solutionism and think mm -hmm. if we just tweak this one little thing, or if we just get this one little person in the right position uh, to, to change these things back the way they were, everything's going to be okay. And it's not, it's not going to be okay. Well, to defend, to defend you guys over in the MMT camp a little bit, that is also endemic among socialists and Marxists who are not MMTers. Um, I mean, one of the weird, one of the weirdest uh, periods of my political life was the early was the was the post two thousand sixteen, but pre twenty twenty Bernie years, um, where like MMTers and Marxists were both on the same side of the aisle on who we were supporting, but also at open war with each other, which was kind of strange. Um, and then there were, th there's a slew of social Democrats like sound money Marxists, like people like Doug Henwood, who really went after MMT and not for the reasons like I might say, which is like, well, you're incomplete. You don't have theory of sociology. You need to think about international politics more. You have to look at, you know, international trade more, but you know, as far as you're describing stuff within the U S it's more or less true. And other countries could do this, right. If they have counter power blocks that are not subject to us hegemony in the same way um uh and i've even gone so far as to say like yeah if we had like people's banking and a transitional economy to something like socialism um mmt would probably be universally practitionable not just practitionable by the great powers but um you know that's my critique right Where, whereas doug henry was like y'all are not good with money that's really what I got. I was like, okay. Yeah, he like, has no detailed critique or understanding or any of that stuff. And uh, yeah, I think uh, Randy Ray's tried to engage him in constructive dialogue, and he just kind of replies with like trolling and and contempt and and whatever, just unserious stuff. I don't, you know, know why he's like that. Um, but it, it's there's like again, like there's there's stuff about. It took me a long time to get my head around a lot of the money stuff. And I had to read a bunch of books because when I first started encountering some of the uh, assertions that MMTers were making, I'm like, that can't be right. That doesn't sound right. That doesn't seem right. Because uh, I was conditioned with a lot of that kind of sound money stuff, too. Like, of course, you have to tax before you can spend and that kind of thing. And actually wrapping my mind around the way money works. And this is not by accident. I'm sure of that. But it was really, really difficult. Okay, it's a uh, you know very abstract. Uh, there's a lot of of kind of convoluted processes you have to get your head around. Uh, you know, balance sheet accounting. Uh, you know, just all of these stuff that I think people are and nobody really teaches you this stuff. And I had to he I had to read a whole bunch of really dense, really boring books. Um, you know, even the best of them were. I had to go through slowly. I had to hear it explained to me the same concept a bunch of different ways, a bunch of different times before I got my mind around it. It's not something I can just expect. You know, I can tell somebody something and they'll they'll grasp it. And so I forgot where I was going with this. 
<laughs> well, I, I mean, it, 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 it isn't easy to pick up MMT because, because like, yeah, at your first, your first response is why do they tax them? Right. Like, and you're like, well, they're maintained, like the taxability of the receipts is what makes the system cl- uh, semi closed, not totally closed. Um, and the taxability of the receipts is why it matters. But if you have a fiat currency, bonds, which is lending, is literally your money supply. So if you're if you're not actually running a deficit, you are contracting your economy actively, um, which does take a while to get. And one of the reasons why that's important. And why, like, why, you know, why do, why the, why do societies keep coming back to forms of fiat currency? Because it's happened and fallen away and happened and fallen away multiple times in human history, right? Um, And it's because if you run like an actual commodity money, you have to, you kind of have to be even more imperialist and you have to like not buy stuff from other countries because it starts siphoning out your metal. So like if you're, I mean, I remember people being like, oh no, we don't want people buying nice dresses or our wine because we're going to lose bullion to that. So let's like ban these trade goods, which of course actually hurts your economy, even in the capitalist sense. And, you know, there you go. And also, for example, deflation, deflation helps debt holders a little bit, you know. It does, you know, absolutely, but eventually it even hurts them because it stops production because you need you need right. credit. For and I, yeah, I, think, happen. I think people don't realize, like uh, you know, another word for depression is a deflationary spiral. Mm-hmm. And you know, obviously, a little deflation. One of the reasons why a lot of these uh, institutions like the gold standard so much was that it was naturally just you know just deflationary enough. To where, um, you know, these farmers were getting hurt because they would have to take out on credit to buy their seed or whatever. And by the time they had their harvest, they were paying back in money that was uh, worth more, I guess, or, you know, had had more purchasing power um, than uh, than the money that, that they took out. And so it was a form of of, uh, of interest on top of the interest. Uh, and that sort of thing. But yeah, that does eventually, um, you know, hurt the, you know, deflationary spirals, like you lay people off, production lines stop, then prices go down further. Uh, y- you you can wind up very quickly with a very serious problem spiraling out of control um, that results in disaster. And if the point of money is to um, to basically get resources where they need to go, uh, you know, the fiat currency... Uh, provides the flexibility and um, you know uh, obviously as they've shown even on pure fiat with a floating exchange rate um, you can still uh, you know maintain you know the I guess the lies to the public uh, to get away with policy wise uh, you know uh, instituting austerity and disciplining labor and still get resources where you want them to go. Yeah, I mean that, that's the thing. So much of this is about labor discipline, and and you, the biggest thing for me that people have to explain to me now. I'm going to say this. I do think, for example, I'm I'm going to state this for you. I don't agree with Warren Mosler that QE has no effect, um, and that is the same thing as open market operations. But uh, why didn't QE? cause massive inflation because it didn't it did not um what caused massive inflation was basically the entire economy right after covid uh having asset inflation and then people just starting to try to rent seek um that and and you know that seems to be a lot of what what did it because the rent seeking increased housing prices and that set up a spiral um and as you know, you know, and I know, and one thing that I have agreed on MMT years on since since this whole inflation busting thing is going on, the Fed knows damn well that raising unemployment right now will not really do much about inflation, but it will discipline labor. 
I mean, real wages haven't gone up since 2021. Um, in fact, they've been going down. Like, and so what do I mean? Well, wages have nowhere near paced inflation. Like, um, we've seen raise increases of like one or two percent. And and yes, in the beginning of COVID, there was a lot of places that kind of hit the fifteen dollar mark because the Fed, as the major, uh, the not the Fed, the um, the federal government as the major employer of labor in the United States did set like a federal minimum of around 15 bucks. And so everybody has to compete with that or the federal government can just out hire them. Um, but it, it's, it's pretty clear to me that like, if the quote demand theory of money is true, uh, you know, which is like, like credit causes of massive amounts of inflation that uh, we sh we should see more inflation than we even are uh, oh, yeah. right now. Like the Japanese should be in triple digits by that standard, and they right. clearly aren't. Right. Um, and what I have come to believe is is uh, is a mixture of cost push and um, and price gouging as what's driving this, and and. Also, monopsony pricing power, aka pricing, you know, pricing power. Yeah, uh, those things much. all together, there's you know, three factors. Demand doesn't play a lot into it. I mean, interestingly, I don't I don't actually see evidence that in a fiat currency society demand really ever plays that much into well, it. Well, no, except in the in a, a backdoor kind of sense. because uh, I, I wrote one article, uh, I think the, the title was The Emperor's New Commodities. That uh, basically the the issue is that uh, these guys have control over certain commodities that are price inelastic, uh, things that people need rather than things they want. You know, like uh, healthcare, like uh, you know, energy fuel, like transportation fuel. Whether you need the transportation fuel or not, you need the food that uses transportation fuel to get to your grocery store shelves. So one way or another, they know that uh, you know. For things like that, people will pay what they have, and if they don't have enough, they'll borrow. And that they have a certain degree of uh, very heavy coercive pricing power that's every bit as potent as if you put a gun to their head and say your money or your life. And you know, using uh, those kinds of things, I think Isabella Weber um, came out with uh, a working paper in January. But she's kind of been been hinting at this for a while and, and writing little articles for Guardian and um, and and other other places that uh, these systemically important commodities uh, and the pricing power over them and the gouging of those prices were largely what was was uh, driving the inflation. And she's got a whole bunch of receipts on that. And, you know, this drove up the price of this, this and this. And you could see even on the CPI that you know uh that elective goods things like consumer electronics were actually going down um so the notion that this had anything to do with those stimulus checks which you know even the timing is off warren mosler pointed that out uh but um you know that had anything to do with the stimulus checks checks or his punishment from the magical market gods for deficit spending which is kind of what some of these people seem to be putting out there it's almost a religious edict there, I've not seen any evidence anywhere that money creation itself has any connection to inflation whatsoever. There has to be an additional step in the process of that money going somewhere and somebody using it in a certain kind of way uh, that uh, that does that. And you know, the demand-based uh, inflation tends to re so rapidly self-correct that uh, you know people don't really notice it. So. Yeah, I think your your assessment is is a hundred percent on point. And yeah, there's people that'll back that up. Demand grace inflation also tends to only be real in, in things that are highly scarce, yeah. um, and and uh, are things that are artificially highly scarce, um, which is another fun thing. Which I I actually ca categorize that this is this is a Marxist proclivity. I admit as a rant, like. Where I'm like, okay, where well you're making artificial scarcity is a way to get is a way to force people to buy, uh, and a lot of times you're doing that through legal means, which means you're involving the state uh, as an enforcer, which means it's basically a rent. 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I was looking at a lot of research. Uh, that Strange Matters magazine um, also ran a bunch of stuff on this where you had key areas of price hiking. You had some real supply chain breakdowns that were that were real and they did lead to some price increases. But what you saw immediately was like systemic, like, oh, we're going to protect ourselves by raising prices dramatically, even though we don't have the actual cost increase from the supply chain breakdown. Our supply chain is working just fine, but since everybody's everybody's is breaking down, we can get away with raising our profit margin this way, at least for a little while. Um, and a lot of these people were bragging about that at their shareholder quarterly meetings. Absolutely. And, and then there's other perverse incentives, and some of these are kind of unique to corporate capitalism, not even like just a capitalism thing. Um, like the first round of tech layoffs, for example, uh, about a year ago, uh, I saw them called, uh, called, oh, it's just social contagion. And I was like, no, it's not. But you're right that it's actually more expensive for these companies to lay them off. Oh, in the long run, it actually can start a death spiral for the company, but it spikes shareholder prices. Right. And it's a way to temporarily inflate your stock is to do layoffs. And, you know, I mean, yeah. Yes, you know, some of these uh, tech, particularly in social media, were hemorrhaging money because a lot of their a lot of their business model was based off leveraging the cost of debt versus the um, versus the very small profits in advertising. Um, but it still costs them more to do the layoffs, particularly when they were just doing like in the very beginning, they were just doing mass layoffs and having to rehire people and like rehire people sometimes for more money. It was just, it was just absurd. And I, and I was like, it's not just social contagion, right? Because that's the whole like, oh, it's just ideology. And I'm like, no, there's got to be a reason. And I was like, oh, it's spike stock, it's, it's spike stock prices. Yeah. And I think I put that in my uh, Emperor's New Commodities article too. There was a, uh, you know, things like, for instance, with uh, oil and natural gas production, uh, you know, there was, uh, I think I linked to an article and I, I'd heard elsewhere as well. Um, you know, I found some other things that said that it absolutely and very clearly would have been profitable for these companies to build more infrastructure to, uh, to you know, to process, to extract uh, and to increase the quantity of this stuff. But what the shareholders wanted in order to maximize value was to uh, to shed those kinds of assets and to, to focus on, you know, quote unquote, core competencies and, you know, outsource those things to other people. And, you know, that basically boosted the, uh, the stock equity. And that's what they go with every time. And there's all of these, these perverse incentives to cannibalize real assets and, and real production uh, in favor of, uh, you know, this, this kind of, of, uh, of, of finance capital and yeah. yeah go ahead no no i mean i just want to back you up um if you want to see the ultimate results of this look at britain right now um it's it's economy is quickly becoming like that of argentina um it's it's probably even more than war-torn area is probably likely to lose more of its its uh its gdp growth than than russia uh, under sanctions regimes or even maybe Ukraine. Um, and why? It's because it's all tied into this parasitic capital. And unlike the United States, Britain had, Brit, the United States produces stuff. It, it's largely in finishing and it's, it, it like doesn't employ a lot of people, unfortunately, but it does produce stuff. Britain doesn't like the big producer powerhouse in Europe is Germany. Um, and uh, my my big fear right now, and, and and to talk about like a cap, like the capital order getting so stupid that it might destroy itself, is the GOP destroying Dodger dollar hegemony to own the libs uh, by pulling the debt ceiling canard. Like that's a real possibility, and I don't think people. I mean, people know it's bad, but I'm like, 
I don't think you quite know how bad it is. <laughs> like, you know, it, it it would ironically actually <laughs> make the G the 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 GOP, the dumbest accidental anti-imperialist that maybe ever existed on Earth. But, um, yeah, it, it's truly frightening. Um, well, the other frightening part is that there is an obvious solution. We were talking about earlier, mint the coin, mm. okay? That, uh, you know, again, you know, since we already discussed, like, the creation of money itself, especially money that never leaves the central bank, that's just there to clear payments, obviously has no connection to inflation or the value of money or anything like that but yet the people on the other side of the equation the democrats are so terrified of the consequences whether they know them the way the the people in the in the business plot did or whether they just uh believe the the kool-aid they've been feeding to other people um they are terrified of indulging in such a move and would rather uh, let everything grind to a screeching halt and implode than uh, just go ahead and do, um, you know, something that would basically solve that particular problem forever. I'm sure the GOP would find something else to, to leverage to hang over people's head, but it's, you know. I mean, it is it's kind of stunning that, 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 the Bi- it's not the Biden administration. It's basically Treasury tricks, which is sort of the Biden administration, but they don't seem to have that much input into that. That stopped it from already kicking in, and uh, it's also based off projected tax receipts, which are slightly down right now. Um, and I'm just, I'm just baffled by it because I'm like, okay, so you guys are either going to accept it's probably the biggest austerity that's been done since Clinton. And you still control one of the branches of Congress. Um, or you're going to, yeah, pull the trigger on dollar hegemony. Because that's the other thing. It takes two to tango on this kind of idiot dance. And this is an idiot dance. Um, and, and like you, I actually have no idea if these people are guileless and stupid are evil now i suspect a little bit of evil because what we've seen over the past two decades particularly after the obama administration kind of finalized and solidified you know clintonism ironically um is that a whole lot of capital outside of like heavily extractive industry now is effectively aligned with the Democrats. Um, and the base of the GOP's donors is like a couple of rich reactionaries who are even even there getting a little bit freaked out and petty bourgeois people who make over 100K but less than, but, uh, but less than 250K. Like, um, so well off, but not rich. And um, it has led to the GOP maybe actually being this stupid. Because in the past, this was a we all kind of knew they might let it go on for a couple of weeks, but they're not actually going to do it. Um, I don't know that we know that anymore. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> um, and and the austerity they're suggesting to avoid it is also severe. I mean, it's it, I don't think people realize it's pretty thorough. It's it's undoing everything that was done in the first two years of the Democratic administration. It is uh, gutting food stamps. It's gutting um, Medicaid. Um, it might actually go after Medicare more. Um, you've even heard them starting to talk about going after Social Security again, which largely not to to give Trump any credit, but largely during the Trump period, Trump is a political reptile enough to know you don't do that. Yes. Stop that shit. (laughs) It is one of the things I had to respect about the guy. He put out uh, an ad recently that uh, I think may have killed DeSantis dead, uh, but it was attacking him. The pudding ad? Yeah. I love that. It was the funniest thing I've seen in ages. I hate Trump as much as the next guy, but I've got to doff my hat for that one, that ad was hilarious it was on point it was just a work of art uh, 
it was also it's also clear to me, and I think I think Democrats don't know how to deal with this when they've called him a fascist for for four years. And and look, I think elements of Trumpism are fascistic before yeah. people come at me. Um, but when when you guys are like on one hand talking about how DeSantis will be better, and then the other hand, Trump is like actively moving to the center from him um on war on abortion on on uh social security on medicare it's going to be real hard to 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 paint that again um i mean last time i saw it trump particularly now after the the uh the indictment polls better in florida than DeSantis does so yeah, and you know, I've been kind of uh, arguing with some uh, history people on on Twitter about that. Like, I feel like they're even people that are otherwise, you know, in their specific areas, good historians. Like uh, Rick Perlstein wrote that book, uh, Reagan Land, did a really detailed history of the rise of Reagan Republicanism. Uh, you know, but his understanding of fascism and that that part of history is impossibly pedestrian. And uh, that is actually one of those areas where a lot of the, the more Marxist-leaning historians uh, have, have been invaluable to my education because they know to go looking for the kinds of details that it doesn't occur to a lot of these, these other people to even challenge. And you're finding, like, there's a lot of important undercurrents in there that you really need to understand to understand what fascism is, how it works, um, and you know, for example, uh, why Clara Matei's work was so important. You know, the economic aspects of it in in particular, and you know, the 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 core aspect of crushing labor. Also, the fact that you know the populism inherent in it is always, always, always astroturfed. Um, yep, astroturfed. Know, and it's it's class based. It's petite bourgeois and uh, people falling into the underclass, aka what we give Marxism tend to call the lumpen, um, who are not actually part of their base and often don't even vote. But you can you can buy them pretty buy easily them, yeah. and uh, use them as paramilitary troops. And actually, as I, I would point out to people, I'm like, you know, the only thing you could maybe say about Trump is there was some unofficial quasi paramilitary people attached to him, but they weren't his. Like they they attached themselves to him, which is not usually right. the way fascism works. Uh, if you want to call him fascistic, I eh, um, he does have some, for instance, things on domestic security that absolutely. Uh, they kind of come across that way. But uh, by and large, he's not coherent enough to really. Um, kind of qualify because you know one of the things that that fascists are are after at their core is stability and uh you know he uh in in some ways is uh too volatile for that particular uh group of people uh you know i honestly like i think george w bush would uh would definitely fit their their bill considerably better than a, a donald trump uh ever did yeah, but, but and another thing I just like to tell people is like, hey, everything doesn't have to be an analogy to World War II. Right. And it, <laughs> one of the, the the things that I well, the reasons I call their analysis so pedestrian is if you under if you adhere to their vision of what fascism is, you think if it doesn't come with jackboots and uh, racism and uh, you know big red swastikas, then it's not fascism. And they fail to realize that. Fascism, to at least some degree, like a watered down version of it, has been with us the entire time. And, you know, in some places elsewhere in the world, at our behest, uh, it's been the old fashioned kind with swastikas, with intact units of the Waffen SS uh, going at our behest to assist in the, the overthrow of Allende and, you know, things, things like that. But I mean, but by and large here, like those core assumptions that Claire Matei talks about, uh, those core tenets of fascism have been with us the whole time. Yeah, I, well, I mean, they're even in our iconography. Um, we have fascists in the American seal. 
uh, my, my, uh, you know, my fundamental thing is like, fascism is right wing. It also flirts with socialism, but it's a capitalist. It's a it's a capitalist response in hyper decay, like. And um, one of the reasons the Anglophone world has kind of avoided it, um, even though all parts of it have existed in American culture and British culture at times, just not together. Um, you, we talk about the like how much the Southern, like, the, you know, I remember one of the dumbest debates that I that I've heard, and th this was, I tend to agree with my friend Danny Besner, but. Um, was about whether or not the KKK is fascist. And I'm like, it's proto-fascistic? Absolutely. And like the Nazis in specific pulled a whole lot of their stuff out of Southern codes. But uh, believe it or not, the Spanish and the Italians didn't. So saying that it, it like that the KKK is fascist, one, makes it sound like it's not indigenous to American culture anyway. And, mm -hmm. and two, which it definitely is, uh, and two, actually leads you to misunderstand non-Nazi forms of fascism. Um, and, and so, you know, like, like I've said, like, I'm okay with calling Trump fascistic because there are some elements, but then there's some major elements that aren't there. Um, and at, at, at the end of the day, we should just like, it's not really that important, except that it'll mess up your understanding of what people might do if you think these people are one to one to Hitler and they're just going to Nuremberg. I mean, like, there's going to be a Reichstag fire or something. Like, right. um, and one of the things I press Democrats on on this, and I press them hard these days, is uh, you told me that a lot of these policies of Trump were fascist, but you have defended them or kept your mouth shut when they've been maintained by Biden. What do you, like, how do you, how do you do that with a straight face and, and ever, like, if we did have a real fascist threat, now who's going to believe you if they understand that? Well, that's the scary thing. And, you know, it's, it's kind of the one of those things that I, I gathered from the, the, the studying the psychology was, um, you know, there's this, I don't know if you're familiar with Leon Festinger's theory of cognitive dissonance. Yep, I am. <laughs> but uh, the degree to which you, you see its power, the ability of people to believe wildly contradictory things and keep those things compartmentalized and defend that compartmentalization, um, you know, to the point of uh, occasionally getting... Uh, you know, violent and unhinged uh, is impressive. And you realize how easy it would be for these people to uh, fall into something, uh, you know, something like a, a modern iteration of fascism, like proper fascism, uh, you know, full-blown uh, authoritarian, militaristic, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And still be, uh, you know, going out there bleeding about, you know, freedom, democracy, we're the freest country in the world, blah, blah, blah. They all thought they were free. I think that was the title of a book that a journalist wrote uh, going through Germany after World War II. The title was They Thought They Were Free. And anytime you go to a place like that where these horrible things have happened and this obvious authoritarianism has happened, a huge chunk of the populace was like, we're free. No, yeah, it's absolutely because it doesn't like that's how authoritarian tends to work is through sovereign exception. And that sovereign exception is attached to one part of the population so that they don't care or they don't care until it's too late. Um, and, you know, I can definitely see that. But what I, you know, one of the things I've t told people about I, this is my my Marxist heart is I'm like, okay, fascism is capitalism decay, but capitalism decay has many forms, almost all of whom are Bonapartist. Uh, but, and by that, we just mean, usually we invest, we overinvest in an authoritarian figure um, to, to get us out. And I'm like, I think my personal opinion about American politics right now is that it's so it's, it, it's a, 
it's bipartisanly bonapartist. We all over invest in the executive branch to the point that we've kind of missed that we, and it was actually the progressives that started this, uh, made the Supreme Court the primary rulers of the country um, because they can interpret law and no one will challenge them anymore. Nobody. Um, which is not historically true until the 1950s. Like prior to that, people show down with the Supreme Court all the time and they usually at least got concessions, if not win. Mm. So it's, 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 it's kind of wild to me. And this has led to this ability to where Congress doesn't really do anything except like the Restrict Act, security bills, uh, austerity, and bailing out banks, which admittedly it has to do for capitalism function, but still, that's what like like you can get you can get bipartisan shit done real fast if it involves those. To, oh, and military budgets. If it involves those four things and then nothing else, mm. like increasingly we we farm that out to the executive, which can be undone by the Supreme Court at a whim, because this executive can't really it's not supposed to legislate. So you know, I see this as a tendency in American culture, and. If you if you want to call that fascistic, then I think you have to admit that like well, there's fascistic tendencies right now in the entire spectrum of the American political uh, apparatus that has any power, and nobody likes hearing that. Right. Like, um, it's just like it's like yeah no you know yeah Trump Trump's awful. Uh, Biden's pretty bad though, and you guys really made it seem like it was a life or death thing to to fight for him. And we needed to, you know, it, we'd have a labor president and infrastructure again. And Josh, yeah, it's it's on, gauche man. fascism versus friendly fascism is basically what our options mm -hmm. seem to be. And you know, I kind of saw that coming just. You know, having a little knowledge of Joe Biden's background, who he was, what he was about. Uh, but it's it, I think it's it, it's turning out as bad as I would have thought it was, maybe even a little bit worse in some cases. So, um, yeah, you know. the immigration stuff was one of the things where I was like, well, you know, he's not going to do enough, but he'll do something. And I he did something for a month and then immediately. Retreated. And then Buckus. Yeah. <laughs> like, um. And I'm like, dude, they're going to call you soft on immigration no matter what. So, <laughs> like, it's not like you're going to get anything for this. But then then you realize oh, there, there must be forces larger than just partisanship that's driving some of this stuff. Yeah, uh, and the partisanship is just kabuki theater, basically, for, you know, bigger forces pulling the strings. Now, I mean, we I, another place where you see this is like, Everyone was concerned about Trump making things hostile with China until Biden came in and it's more hostile. Um, like, so it's like, okay, like, you know, no one was talking about moving, moving uh, ships to the Strait of Taiwan directly, even that, um, even though, you know, I remember liberals raising hell about Trump taking the call of the, of the president of Taiwan. Um, and now I'm like, you guys are shutting up on this too? Like, what do you believe in? Um, you know, this is not even getting into stuff like Medicare for all and all that. Like, it's just, what do you believe in, guys? Like, um, but anyway, uh, and, and so I do think we're kind of in dire straits right now, and I, I, it's been it's been nice. How do I say this politely? Um, the this current crisis has been, I, I think, pushed a lot of MMTers out of their cognitive dissonance, or they've had to double down. And so you've seen, like, there's a lot more MMTers now willing to talk to me on a friendly or at least, you know, amicable basis where I was debating you guys four years ago. Um, and I think that's good because up until 2020... Um, I think some people got a false sense that like the, the, the powers that be were just going to like, oh, you'll get to implement an MNT program without that much political struggle. Um, uh, and I remember, I remember like 
thinking, is that going to happen myself? Because like people who would normally not get the time of day we're getting, we're getting, you know, interviewed on economics podcasts that normally would not talk to any heterodox economists, regardless of what they were. Um, and they turned on y'all so fast. Like it was, I was kind of shocked. Like, yeah. well, one of the things is they think MMT is something you do rather than uh, kind of a, a lens of analysis. And, uh, you know, by and large, it's it's supposed to be kind of, um, you know, a way that you decide what your options are, but not something that has that is like something you implement. Um, and so basically when they started, uh, this was a way that I think a lot of these kinds of, um, you know, neoliberal, neoclassical type uh, people were deflecting uh, from their their own um, mismanagement or failure to act uh, in a lot of ways and saying, oh, all this inflation came because we deficit spent. We did MMT. They're equating the two and uh, basically made MMT the scapegoat. Which uh, they yeah. know, which I, I remember because I started that's when I was started defending MMT a little bit because I was like, that's bullshit. Y'all like like one. Like in so much that there are MMTers with normative political programs, and there are like, mm -hmm. but we do need to separate that out from the description of how fiat currency works. We said that right here. Um, it, it's true that I think, unfortunately, um, even though I will also say the people who were involved in this didn't did say this, but I don't think they said it loud enough. That the descriptive part and the normative part actually are separate. Like, because you can be an MMT -er and be a totally right wing shitbag. Oh, yeah. Like, like, um, it, it, it's, not, it's not even that hard, actually. Um, so, but, you know, when Kelton and, and stuff, they, I think they really thought they, they could get the Democrats to implement, implement some of the policies based off of their analysis. And uh, I felt like I'm not meaning to sound conspiratorial, but I felt like certain sectors of finance capital was fine as long as you didn't, as long as they were like, well, you're saying we can print more money and dump it in the assets and do as QE as much as we want. And, ba you know, uh, and then as soon as there's any inflation for any reason, we're going to throw you under the bus. Right. Like, which is what they did. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I was like, man, I just remember thinking when that was happening, like they played some of y'all, <laughs> like they really did. But it, in some ways, it's good um, because on one hand, I know more and more Marxists who are willing to say, you know what, MMT at least has something meaningful to say about fiat currency, and we live in a fiat currency system. Like we just have to admit that. And you know, if you want to insist that somehow this is still a commodity backed money somewhere, you're going to have to like figure out what commodity is actually backing it. And even oil doesn't work. Like, so, you know, there, there is no ultimate singular commodity backing any of this. It's the production of the entire system and it's in its national trades that are, that are backing it and it's tax receipts that make it, make it a currency that we use. Like there, you know, there you go. Um, and I will also say, like, uh, uh, um, Professor Katub, uh, for example, there was more and more serious analysis of international systems in the MNP world because early on, that was my big critique. It's like, you guys aren't looking at, you guys just say they don't have currencies to serve. Uh, oh, Fatal Kaboob. Right, Fatal Kaboob, yeah. Yeah. And um, you get, you, you know, and, and that was my big disagreement early on. I lived in Egypt when the currency collapsed, when they free floated it on the, on the, on the suggestion of the World Bank. Um, and also China was asking him to do it too. Um, and like, it was nominally good for me because I got paid pegged to USD and then all of a sudden I made a ton of money, but um, it was terrible for Egyptians. Like it was a nightmare. And 
when MMTers would talk to me about it in 2015, 2016, 2017, except for Fatah Kaboob, uh, we would get like, well, it's an ideological choice. And I'm like, I would just stare at them like, no, no, uh, uh, they were forced to pay stuff in dollars. They don't have a choice. Like it's not like even a place like Venezuela has a hard time not paying stuff in dollars. Come on. It's not, it, they're not pegging their money to the dollar out of an ideological commitment to the United States world order, dude. Like, um, but uh, Kaboob really has done some great work on how you could mitigate for that. Um, and I was like, okay, that finally someone's being serious about this. So, so it's the, the period that I'm kind of being hard on you about. It's also a period where I think we actually saw some good research also come out of it, particularly because no one wanted like a fiasco, like what happened with Grexit again, or didn't happen with Grexit. Uh, or what pro what possibly could have happened with Gretzit. Like, we didn't want any more Giannis Varifakis's in the world. Um, sorry, Giannis. Um, uh, so, and I, I, I think that that's been really important. And the other thing I'll tell you is, like, Marxists are usually so busy arguing about value theory. We don't usually, like, it's amazing how little work we've done on money. Yeah, I've been noticing that too. And, uh, you know, I, I did watch your, your two hour live stream on uh, the history of Trotskyism. And, and basically, you just got through kind of the introductory part of it, basically just, just talking about all the splitting and all the arguing. That, yep. uh, oh, well, here's the funny thing during that, you, you, you think things are bad now. During that time period, the Trotskyist, the, the Marxist Leninist, and the Marxist Leninist Maoist, so from like the 50s to the 80s, Marxists weirdly did not actually, in general, have economic programs of any substance. It was mostly purely political programs, which is crazy. Like, it's just like, to me, I'm like, wait, that's that's our strength. Like, we do economics and sociology. That's what we do. We kind of invented the field. Like, so that's Marx. That's dialectical materialism. Right. That's, that's what I found appealing in it and uh, why I think those those kind of two lenses of analysis sort of need each other to be any good to anyone. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you're right. When we get when we get into like the history of Trotskyism, the one thing I will tell you is and uh, we I think we did say it in there, but it's only like a minute. It's like none of these groups have real strong economic analysis at all. They are are they assumed that the declining rates of profit was just going to immediately hit and wipe out all the capitalism. And, you know, then they could fight for power and that was going to be it. I believe you said Trotsky himself was particularly crappy as an economist. Oh yeah. He's bad. I, I told you he believed in the gold standard. He thought that capitalism was going to collapse in the 1950s. Uh, bad, but unfortunately in general, uh, Marxist, ironically, during the period of the upcoming of Marxism, Marxist economics actually wasn't particularly developed in that period in specific. So it's it's actually kind of ironic because like when you have societies that are trying to implement this revolution, you have a lot of economic writing in the beginning, but in the development of the USSR and the development of China, um, basically particularly after the collectivization of agriculture until until liberalization there isn't actually that much um economic analysis going on outside of say goss plan or trying to just run the internal economy which is which was really complicated um and they were using all their resources on that which actually opened them up on the international front and they started taking loans and then get pulled into the international capital system and well, we all know where that went. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it's actually kind of a major tragedy um, that, that that was the case. And um, in Western Marxism, and I'm not just talking about like Trotskyism or Western Maoism here. I'm even talking about like the, the economic thinkers. 
there was either a tendency to try to hybridize with Keynesianism, which I think is a terrible mistake, um, or to um, declare that basically the law of value had been solved by monopoly capital, and that thus we didn't really need to do any of that anymore. Um, because the predicted uh, mega crash of the 50s never happened, they were just like, well, it must be done. And yeah, yeah, that's a mistake too. And I have come around to the idea that part of this is because Marxists don't and did not entirely think money was that important to uh, how power operated. Um, that they saw it as like part of the MCM circuit and like important that way, but that they basically took the Adam Smith view of money at face value. And thus, when monetary stuff was done to regulate the business cycle to some degree, they were blindsided by it and then thought the capitalism was over. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it's there were there were exceptions. Um, uh, Paul Maddox, one of them, Heinrich Grossman's another. Um, some of the administrative state theorists like uh, uh, Friedrich Pollock. But in general, that's where they went. And. It's a it's a it's a historic tragedy. But during the same time period, I mean, you know, one of the I, one of the weird ironies of the German historical school, which neo chartalism is sort of an English descendant of, um, uh, uh, Friedrich Knapp was was a chartalist, but he was also a German historical through economist of the second generation. Um, our, he's kind of in between generations. Um, and the German historical school didn't really pick him up. He gets picked up. He gets translated at, at, at the uh, at the behest of Keynes, and then like no one really does anything with him other than Ennis um, and Charles Michel Ennis until Minsky, really. And then you know Mosler and people finding him again, um, and that's really interesting to me because you know during the fifties where all this is really beginning like okay all the stuff that we think of the pre the conditions of of fiat currency is really happening from the 20s to the to the 60s 70s setting it all up but in that period it actually is the time period no one's actually doing that kind of economics so there's just on on both scales there's just lost time you know like yeah it's and and during that time period, that's when the Keynesians get all bad. <laughs> I mean, they were never great. I'm, I'm, you know my opinion about that. But it, it, you really see what 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 is good in Keynes? They take out of it in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Oh yeah, that was that was Samuelson was the leader of of uh, sanitizing. You know what little was good in there. But I read that in the long run, we're all dead. And you know mm -hmm. I have no no argument with with any of that like that's all uh spot on analysis that you know at the core uh this is you know this uh defense of the current order and this belief that uh you know the capital order is what stands between uh you know civilization and utter barbarian chaos uh and it, that's their their driving force at the end of the day yeah absolutely i mean uh, I think I told you I, it was an offhand comment I, I, I made on uh, on macro and cheese where I was like, the reason why we didn't get full fascism in the Americas was Keynesianism did some of the same things. Mm. And, um, and uh, it was less violent. So, um, and, uh, you know, uh, you, you would shout to me and you're like, yeah, Claire Mate agrees with you. And I was like, well, good. She's right. Uh, so and I think that's her, her next book project is, is basically, uh, you know, Keynes and, and the post-war consensus. She does touch on it in the first book as well, that he was definitely part of this, uh, you know, kind of the, the liberal track of this, um, you know, economistic capital order, um, you know, uh, you know, these, this, um, basically their, their whole agenda. So there was like the liberal track and the fascist track, but they were basically, trying to achieve the same things and and uh it was it was a difference of degree rather than type and uh that, that Keynes was definitely within the same consensus 
Yeah, totally. So uh, as we wrap this down, I'm going to summarize all the books we brought up because one of the things I will also tell you, MMTers and Marxists tend to be avid readers, but we don't tend to read the same things. And so when we we should share book lists more often. Um, so uh, we've mentioned Clermontay's Capital Order. We've mentioned um, In the Long Run, We're All Dead. And that is uh, by, I'm trying to remember, I have it, uh, Jeff Mann. Um, we mentioned The Nobel Factor by Soderbergh and, and um, uh, Soderbergh and Offer. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything else we mentioned? Um, I think Murawski was involved in the first three chapters, but then ditched the project. Oh, yeah. I would also say read all the Murawski books on neoliberalism. Oh, my God. Oh, I love those. Those were some of the first things that got me into it. Um, I read the David Harvey, which, you know, the Marxist book on neoliberalism. And as a Marxist, I was like, crap. Um, and then I read the Murawski books. And even though he's he's not a Marxist at all, um, I was like, oh, no, this explains so much to me about what this is actually doing um, and why it's sneaky, how it develops out of Fordism, because everyone thinks that like neoliberalism is this clear negation of Fordism and it isn't. Um, like it's, it, 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 that, those books are brilliant. So yeah, uh, More Light Than Heat and Never Let a Good Crisis Go to Right by Phil, Philip Morawski are also excellent. Uh, actually, when I went independent as a podcaster, went rogue in 2014, he was my first interview with Philip Murawski. So, um, uh, unfortunately, I think it is still available on the internet somewhere. Um, I'm going to look so, for that. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, any other things you can suggest? Like I said, your art, I'm going to list the three articles we brought up in the show notes. Um, uh, guys, go check out Will Progressives. Um there's you guys are doing a lot more overlap with Marxist and Marxist thinkers and geopolitical thinkers these days. And I think that's good because a lot of MMTers need to hear it. Um, conversely, a lot of Marxists need to think a lot more hard about money, even if we don't always come to the same conclusions and, as all the MMTers on policy or on how society might work. Um, we do have to deal with the fact we live in a fiat currency system and frankly, what what did win me over to you guys having a point was that uh, uh, your stuff is more predictive, frankly. Um, uh, I, I will, however, say my, my critique still remains that we still have to work out what's going on internationally because I don't think there's a singular theory that's really right on that yet. Right. Um, um, and particularly as the monetary the world monetary system is shifting, it's going to be important to figure that out. Um, so hopefully people pick up that charge. Maybe one of you listeners will go in and take take one for us all and get a degree in economics, unlearn everything that you learn, and then do research on this. <laughs> so, um, God, did you ever take a, ne a neoclassical economics class ever? Like, uh, you know, intro standard. level, like 100, 200. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I took some international development courses and like, they were teaching me things that I was like, I know for a fact, this is wrong. Like, I know for a fact, this is wrong. Like I can, I can cite examples of countries. Like, I think they were, they were saying things like, oh, this, uh, ISI industrial policy doesn't work and it's counterproductive and you yeah. know, blah, Next blah, thing. blah. And I'm like, I know for a fact, like I can name, you know, South Korea, uh, you know, Israel, uh, you know, I can't physical. think of a successful country, including the United States, that does what neoclassical suggests they should do. Yeah, I think um, Michael Hudson wrote a whole book on it, America's Protectionist Takeoff, which is also uh, recommended reading. Uh, you know, kind of goes into the forgotten 19th century American school of uh, protectionist economists. And, you know, it's everybody who's ever grown from a an undeveloped backwater to... Um, to an industrial, you know, modern industrial uh, powerhouse has has basically done some measure of industrial policy and planning. Yeah, you know who got me on this? This was before I was even a Marxist. It was uh, it was uh, Armarta Sen comparing India to China, and I was like, hmm, 
Hmm. Like, like, you know, that's enough to get you to realize like, Oh no, that, that, that neoclassical neoliberal stuff will destroy a country if they do it. It just puts them out. Oh, yeah. It opens them up to labor arbitrage. It opens them up to like capital flight. It's a bad idea. Um, and the six, and then you just look at history. The successful capitalist countries didn't do it. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's like, you know, it's like you're, you're swimming in the ocean and, you know, there's this little thing that's, that's keeping the, you know, the, the dangerous stuff away, or maybe I should say the river because piranhas live in a river, but you're, you're opening up the gate and letting the piranhas in to feed on you. Like yeah. why? Yeah. Don't do it. Um, so yeah, we'll add those books. To, there's so many books to read, but, um, I think that's great. Uh, so People should check out Macro and Cheese. Is there anything else you'd like to plug? Uh, nothing I can think of at the moment, but I'm sure after I get off, I'll think of three things. But <laughs> it's uh, it, in the meantime, like I, I would second the recommendation for for overlapping reading lists, and I'm grateful to you for your suggestions already. Yeah, thank you. I, I you I will say you're you're uh, Claire Met Mate, I found from you guys, and that was funny because she's Marxist. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, I was like, wait, why aren't we talking about this book in Marx circles? Um, Connective so, tissue, I love it. <laughs> um, so yeah, and and uh, yeah, I would definitely suggest that. Uh, check out Real Progressives. Like I said, I'll link your articles in the show notes. Thank you so much for coming on, and um, I hope that our circles continue to overlap. Me too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.